Hi, welcome back. So in today's tutorial, we're going to be looking at how do we take our background terrain and how do we start optimizing our background terrain. So we're just going to go ahead and grab this element of the list and put this up right at the top here. And this is what we're going to be looking at today, cutting up the background terrain into slices. Uh, we're also going to have a look at reducing the triangle density of the terrain as it gets further away from the playable space. Okay, so this tutorial is going to follow on directly from a uh, from the previous tutorial, uh, Endless Background Terrain in Unreal. Uh, so if you are not uh, up to this stage in the tutorial series, I would recommend going back through and watching the videos up to this point, as you will need that video in order to understand uh, and have the project files that relate to this one. So. Why do we need to reduce the uh, the background terrain and why do we need to cut it up into slices? Well, let's just have a little think about that for a second. I'm gonna go up to the uh, world outliner on the right here, and I'm gonna just hide the volumetric clouds for a second. I'm also gonna go up to the show tab and disable the fog. And now we're looking at the scene with a little bit more clarity. Uh, I'm also going to go to the game settings here and I'm gonna change the exposure and put that at a fixed uh, one so that I can we can all see clearly what's going on here. Okay. So let's have a look at this terrain. We've got our playable space in the middle. If I press Alt 2 and switch to the wireframe mode, we can see that we have all of that lovely dense detail which is being represented by the height field. But if we have a look towards the, uh, the outside of the playable area, we can see that we've got this wireframe for the background terrain. And if I select one portion of it, the whole terrain is getting highlighted. Okay, so why is this significant? Well, it's significant because it's currently just one mesh, which means that if you can see any portion of the mesh, the whole mesh is going to be visible. Uh, that's not ideal because if we just pop into the editor, the static mesh editor, and look at the number of triangles that this mesh has, we can see that currently it's 437,000 tries. And those are 437,000 tries. They're going to be visible at all points from within the playable area. Because unless you're looking directly down at the ground or directly up at the sky, you're going to be seeing a portion of that background terrain, even through the small gaps in the mountains there. So how are we going to optimize that? Well, it might be helpful to visualize a pizza after it's been sliced. We're going to do exactly that with this portion of terrain. And we're going to basically divide it up into some sections so that when we're looking across the terrain out from the center, I'm just going to change the color of my pen here. Say we're in the middle of the terrain here and looking out this direction. Well, then we only need to load up the slices which are currently in view. So if you're really fortunate and you've laid it out like this, you might only have to load one tile. So we've already cut that 400,000 tries but into uh, it down by uh, what to a quarter of the 4, 400,000 tries. Uh, in most cases with this kind of setup, you're going to be loading probably two of these at a time. So we're not looking at that much of an optimization here. We're only cutting it by half, which is actually not something to sniff at. But we can go a little bit further. So we'll probably end up dividing those sections once more. Uh, and, uh, and, and now you can imagine that when we're looking off in this direction, uh, perhaps we're going to be loading just uh, two of those tiles or in maybe in some cases three. So as you spin the camera around, it's going to be selectively loading and unloading those triangles based off of which are currently visible. And that's going to give us a big performance uplift uh, in terms of the number of tries. Well, I say that's going to give us a big performance uplift. Uh, those 400,000 tries, if you get that down to just two slices, uh, so what's that? How many slices we've got here? Eight. Uh, 400,000 divided by uh, eight. Well, that's 50,000. So you're, you've got you've gone down from maybe 400,000 tries always loaded to 50,000 tries, and that's 350,000 tries that you can just spend somewhere where the player is going to notice it more easily in the playable zone. Okay, now there's something else about this which is currently not ideal, which you might have already guessed, and that's the fact that it doesn't matter how far away we get from the playable area, the triangle density seems to be largely fixed. Uh, it's the same everywhere. Uh, and this isn't necessary because if we're sticking within the playable confines here of this tile, then we're not going to notice all of that detail which you would have uh, further and further away um, you can see that when we look at the wireframe like this, it's just solid yellow. And that means that we're drawing more triangles than there are pixels on the screen, which is very, very far from ideal. And actually, if we go up to the optimization view modes up here and turn on the quad overdraw view mode, you can see that we're getting lots of green there. Now, you would expect to see potentially some green on the terrain as it gets uh, closer to the player. 
um, just because we want more density uh, in the playable area. Although that's actually less than ideal too. So we'll have a look at how we can improve the optimization of the playable zone in a future tutorial. But right now we're just going to worry about that background terrain and make sure that we have a fall off in quad density the further away from the playable area we get so that we keep it a nice blue color and we're not wasteful in the number of tries that are being dedicated to something that only realistically is going to fill up a small portion of the screen, even if that small portion of the screen does contribute a lot to the overall feel of the environment. Okay, so we're going to be jumping back inside of Houdini now. And uh, this is the project in the state that we left it at the end of the endless background terrain tutorial. And uh, if you've just opened up this to talk this project file, uh, which you created it, uh, when you were following that tutorial, and you've noticed that it took a very long time computing some things while opening. Uh, that's because it had to compute the convert height field, poly reduce, uh, ray, and Boolean nodes um, once the project was opened again. Now, that's going to be cached as long as the project remains open in, in memory. But actually, what we can do is we can make it so that we do not have to compute all of those things when we, whenever we open the project for the first time. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to create a file cache node here, and we're going to plug that in after the divide here. And what we're going to do is we're just going to set this to load from disk, and then we're going to hit save to disk like that. And now you're going to see it's going to think for a second while it computes a few things. And we seem to have a little issue there. I'm not sure what that is. So let's have a little look. It seems to have worked fine. So I'm not sure why it gave us that error. Uh, but if you'll see, if we now disconnect the divide, we still get that uh, height field there. So it's clear that this file cache is now loading from the disk and no longer relies on the operations that have preceded it. I'm going to connect that back up now. If we wanted to modify our background terrain geometry, uh, then we could go back in and start tweaking the reduction amount, start tweaking the ray settings or whatever else we really wanted to do. Uh, we would just have to remember that we then needed to go and hit the save to disk button again so that we recache the file to disk. Okay, uh, oopsie daisy. I don't know why it's, I just hit control S to save and it's a, it's just popped up the save as menu. So um, for some reason, my Houdini is behaving a little strangely today, but I'm just gonna reselect that file and hit accept and overwrite. Yes, that's fine. And now if I hit control S again, there you go. That's behaving the way I expected it to. All right, so you might be wondering why we did the file cache before the transform node. And that's because I'm going to insert another node between the file cache and the transform node. And I'm just thinking of this transform as uh, the last, very last thing step, the very last step we're going to do before we uh, actually write the file to disk, if we ever want to write this file to disk again. And we're going to have to do that before every single uh, FBX output or uh, export because we're working in Houdini scale and we're just remembering to scale it by 100 before we send it to Unreal. So that's what's happening in that transform there. And the node that we're going to insert in this graph here uh, is a null. Uh, so we're going to right click and search null or you can press tab and search null. And I'm going to name that null out background terrain unoptimized like so. Okay. Uh, now, because I like to keep things a little looking a little bit more organized, I'm going to press C and I'm going to set that color to be blue and then Z and I'm going to set that to be a circle uh, just because that's the way I like to do, do things. You can set it to whatever shape and color you like. And then I'm going to insert that just by dragging it over those two wires. Uh, that wire uh, is going to split it like so and insert it there. Okay. So why did we do that? Well, it's because I like to break my work up into logical chunks. And I think of this chunk as the chunk where I create the geometry for the background terrain, ensure that it fits around the uh, playable area. Uh, and we've kind of done a little bit of a reduction from the, the map box uh, sort of satellite data input. So, so I'm happy to think of this as a finished block of work. And I'm going to think of the pizza slicing and further the reduction as the next block of work, which I'm going to do over to the right over here. So in order to get that uh, over here and referenced, we're going to use the same method we used in previous tutorials, which is we're going to use an object merge. So I'm gonna go down and create an object merge here to the right. And I've just noticed while I was looking at those other object merges that I'm already using blue here. So actually it's not very organized. It's not ideal for me to use blue here as well, because that's gonna get a little bit confusing. Uh, and I like to be able to glance at my graph and see uh, just in an instant, uh, which merges match up with which nulls. So I'm going to grab both of these and I'm going to set those to a sort of off pink color. Yeah, I'm not using that anywhere else. Okay, good. Now with the object merge selected so that we can see its parameter view, I'm just going to grab this null and I'm going to drag that up in here to the object one slot. 
And now if I change the focus to the object merge, it's disappeared, but that's because we were looking at the result of the transform, which was scaling by 100. So if I look at that here and then press F with so I've selected the viewport, it's going to snap to that there. And if I switch between the out here and the merge there, there's no difference. It's exactly the same geometry. So this object merge is also going to benefit from this cache that we created here. So we won't have to recompute any of this again unless we choose to. Okay. So I've built, brought this up over to the right where I want to create my new graph for slicing. And uh, the way that I like to fit, slice this up is uh, I like to insert a node called circle, the uh, circle sop that is. And uh, if I change the focus to the circle, you're going to see it's disappeared again. And that's just because the circle is at a completely different scale to the terrain. So I'm just going to hit F to focus that there. And what we're looking at? Well, we're looking at a circle primitive. I actually want that to be a polygon mesh. So I'm going to go up to primitive type and change that to polygon. And uh, you can see that, well, we don't have any edges, but that might be because I haven't got the edge display on. So I'm going to make sure that I tick smooth wire shaded. And that's not the reason. Okay, so what is it? Well, if you have a look in the parameter view, you can see that we've got this arc type selection menu here, and I'm going to make sure that's set to sliced arc. Okay, so straight away, we're getting that kind of pizza slice look that we want. So we're on the right path. But I don't want to do this many divisions. Uh, maybe I'll want to tweak the amount of divisions later. But for now, I'm just going to set that to... Mm, let's go with 10. Okay, yeah, that's... No, do I want 10? So <laughs> have another little look. No, I think I do want to go with 8 for the time being. Yeah, we're going to go, go with 8. Um, okay, so we also want to set the orientation to be on the ZX plane so that it's facing up. Uh, in this case, it's actually uh, facing down. Um, so if you just want to, if that bugs you like it bugs me, then you can just go ahead and reverse that there. And uh, now we're going to worry about making that circle match up with the scale of the terrain. You can see that if I focus the circle again, actually the reverse, and then press the little purple icon on the bottom right of that menu there, um, we're going to press F to snap to the circle. And you can see the terrain is just at a completely different scale to the circle. So that's what we're going to need to deal with. Okay, so how are we going to do that? Well, uh, one second, I'm just going to switch back to the terrain by focusing it and hitting F. I'm also going to get rid of that little purple preview there. Well, you could obviously just go and grab this circle. I'm going to switch that preview on there. And you could get this, this radius and start to drag up that value there. Uh, okay, so nothing happened. Why is that? Well, it's because we need to set the radius for both these values here. And you can see now that we've got that kind of faint gray overlay of the circle. But I don't want to have to sort of plug the values into both of these every time I make a small change. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to copy. I'm going to right click that first input box. I'm going to click copy parameter. I'm going to get the second one. I'm going to go paste relative references. And now you'll see that if I sort of type in a new value here, it's going to update automatically. And you can click radius over here and you'll see that that little script there uh, has, that little reference there is now updating whenever I change this value. Okay, but what if I wanted to change the size of the terrain input? What if I went back here, got a new section of terrain, fed it through, saved the cache, brought it over here, and now it didn't have the same dimensions? Well, the problem with, with what I've got here is I'm gonna have to manually update the circle every single time. And I don't wanna do that because I'm lazy. So we're going to do another little reference here. And the reference we're going to do is we're going to type in a little script here called vbox. And then we have to find the name of the node we want. So what we can do is we can type in vbox, uh, open braces, and then uh, quotation marks, dot, dot, forward slash. And you can see we get a list of all the nodes currently in this network. So we can see the node we want is called object merge. Uh, object merge four is the one. I'm just going to double click that. I'm going to close the quotation marks, close the braces, and what have I done wrong? I've made a mistake. Uh, that's the fact. Uh, the issue I've made is I haven't actually selected which axes uh, I want the B box to look at. I don't. I haven't decided which uh, if it's the X, Y, or Z axis that I'm using. So okay, to go back a couple of steps, I'm going to write B box again, and you can see if we ever look at this tooltip here that we need to supply a surface node. That's what we did previously, but also a type, and the type can be X min, Y min, Z min and all the maxes, and also the sizes there, x size, y size, z size, z size. And because we're a square, it doesn't really matter if we use the x or the z, z size. Uh, remember that in Houdini, y is up, so we don't want to use that. So I'm just going to paste back that value that I, I copied out there. You might have to retype it if you didn't copy that. And I'm just going to type in d underscore x size. Okay, what's happened now? Okay, great. You can see that it is, uh, it's accounting for the size of that, that object. Um, I could go in here and create a little transform node for the 
uh, after the file cache before the null. And if I just drag that up, you're going to see the circle is scaling along with it. So that's great. That means if we go back uh, and make any changes, that's all going to be non-destructive and the, the circle size is going to update accordingly. But you can currently see that the slice is uh, extending way, 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 way outside of the bounds of that. So I'm going to go into the circle here and I'm actually going to do a times 0.5 there. And that's that's more like it. So it's it sort of uh, seems like it's the right size now, but you can see that it's a little bit off center. So to bring it back into center, um, this, <laughs> this wouldn't normally be a problem, but because uh, I've been a little bit sloppy uh, and I actually have that byte taken out of the background terrain and that's off center, uh, for this one, I am going to break the non-destructive editing nature of it slightly uh, and I'm going to pull the... Uh, you know what? Scratch that. We're not going to do that. We're not going to be lazy. We're going to set it up to be smart as well. So I'm going to go over and we're going to find the height field high res that we've got over here. Okay, so that looks like it's already resulting from cache. Yes, there you go. So we set up the cache there. So there was no computation required for that. I'm just going to copy this object merge. We're going to bring that up here too. And what we're going to do is exactly the same as above where we reference this object merge, except this time we're going to use the centroid. Okay. And what we're going to do, we're going to do the same thing again, except this time it's object merge five. So to save some time, I'm just going to double click that, close that, put a comma, and then I'm going to type in, uh, this time you can see if you look at the tooltip, we have DX, DY, and DZ. So that's nice and simple. So I'm going to do DX and we're going to do DZ there. And now we have that perfectly centered on our, uh, on our high poly geometry. So we can have a, uh, let's change the focus to this reverse and let's set the preview to this merge. And great, now we can see that our pizza slice is perfectly centered on the center of the playable terrain. It's still clipping slightly with the outer bounds of the landscape there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to just go and quickly apply a smaller multiplier, 0.45. Okay, so that's now fitting within that background terrain slice, great. Okay, so we're part way towards achieving our goal. We've got the slices, or at least we've got the, the, the slate, the shape uh, that we're going to use, um, but we want to now actually slice up that uh, high poly terrain that we've got. So how are we going to start thinking about slicing? Well, this is where we're going to start using something called a for loop. Uh, so we're gonna do a for each primitive because each part of this, I'm gonna disable the preview there again, each segment of this pizza or circle has a primitive ID. And you see, if I press this little icon to the right side of the view there, we can see the primitive ID of all of these. Now, if I plug the output of the reverse into the for each and preview that, you're gonna see that it's getting those slices one at a time. And if I preview the output of the for each loop, we can see all of them. So it's processing each of them one by one. If I go here and tick single pass and drag this slider, you can selectively look at each slice one at a time. So that's a nice little feature there. Now we want to pass in, I'm just going to reorganize this slightly off to the right, and I'm just gonna bring here. Now we want to bring in our high poly terrain, and somehow we want to uh, sort of cut it up, uh, cut it up so that I'm gonna turn off the preview there. We're gonna cut it up so that we output each of those slices, but they've been separated. And uh, the way we're gonna do that as well, we're first going to plug that into our for each loop, and we're gonna set the method to fetch input because we're not trying to fetch pieces or points in this case, we're just trying to fetch the whole terrain. Now if we have a look there, you can see the whole terrain has been piped into the for each loop. So some of you might already have a guess for what kind of node we're gonna use here because we previously already used it. Uh, and if you did guess correctly, uh, the where is that again? It's this Boolean node there. So congrats to you if you've got that. We're gonna be using the Boolean node again. So I'm gonna right click and I search Boolean and I want to use a Boolean intercept. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I want to find the geometry only where this geometry exists and this geometry exists. Wherever both exist and it inter is intersecting, that's what's gonna get output. Now, oh no, what happens if we plug this in uh, and we wait? Nothing. And why is that? Well, it's because a Boolean accepts, expects two 3D objects to intersect, or at least one 3D object to be intersecting. And currently we have two surfaces, uh, or at least uh, that's a slight simplification, but in this case, it would be just helpful to think of it that way. Uh, we need to have at least one 3D volume in order for this Boolean to output anything useful. So where are we gonna do that? Well, let's have a little look at this for each loop again. Uh, we've got our slice and we want to add some thickness to it. What happens if we just type in thicken? Oh, look, fortunately, the nice labs guys have actually created a node that is exactly what we're looking for. So I'm gonna preview the thicken 
and the depth by default is going to be quite low. So I'm going to type in a much higher value. Let's try 100. That's not really enough. Remember, this is uh, this is on the scale of a terrain, and this is in meters. So uh, 100 meters is actually only a small portion of that. I'm going to go a thousand. Uh, I believe I believe that's in meters. Someone, if someone wants to correct me in the in the comments, please feel free because I, I can't actually remember. I'm not sure right now. We're going to set it to be both directions, like so. And now let's have a little look at that boolean. There we go. That's giving us what we want. To be on the safe side, I'm going to go back to this thicken, and I'm actually just going to set that to 5,000. So we've got a nice big fat wedge uh, that's going to be intersecting with the boolean. Okay, let's have a little look there. What's this warning it's giving us? Uh, cross boundary, unshared edges in solid A. Uh, it seems to have done the trick, so I'm not going to worry too much about that. If anyone has an idea of what's causing that, uh, let me know in the comments as well. And <laughs> perhaps later in the tutorial, that will cause a stumbling block for us. But we'll deal with that when we get to it. Now. Right now, you can see that set A is being treated as a solid and set B is treating, being treated as the solid. And uh, this is actually just a, a 2D surface. So what we're going to do is we're going to set that to be a surface and we don't want it to self-intercept. There we go. And OK, great. That's actually gotten rid of that error message there. So cool. If we now plug this output into the for reach then end there and let it cycle over these primitives, you can see down in the bottom left, we've got all of our passes. It's taking a little while to compute, but we're going we're gonna to live with that for the time being and deal with speeding that up later. OK, and you can see now where we previously had our square background terrain, it's now been sliced up into a circle. And although it's a little bit tricky to see, we do now have those pizza cuts. I'm just going to draw over the top of it there. There, I'll switch the color slightly more visible. So we've sliced up our terrain. Uh, that's already a good first step. And uh, what next? Well, um, I'm just going to apply a color to each of those to make the visualization slightly more easy. So I'm going to go to color here. And I'm actually <laughs> I'm regretting putting it inside the for each loop because we're going to have to wait for it to compile between every single time. So I'm actually going to extract that again. And we're going to have to wait for it to compile once more. Okay. So we've got our color set after here. And if we ever look through the class and color type, we've got the ability to set the color on a point or on a primitive. Uh, we've also got the ability to control how the color gets set. And if we ever look in here, uh, we can set a random from attribute. So that's the one that we're going to use, a random from attribute. But we need to define the attribute that it's going to use to, uh, to color each of these segments dif differently. Now, Assuming that our Boolean has correctly separated that one piece of geometry into a few different pieces of geometry, they will no longer be connected. So let's have a little look for a node called connectivity. We're going to slide, slide that in there after the for each end. And uh, we're going to make sure that this is actually, it's all set up correctly. It's creating an attribute called class, uh, connectivity type point, uh, attribute type integer. So if we want to have a quick little inspection of this attribute, we can go up above the viewport and click on the geometry spreadsheet. And you're going to see, indeed, we've now got this class attribute in the point attributes. And if we slide this down, we can see that we've got uh, different values in that class in that class section, uh, which lots of points are sharing. But it, go, it ranges from 0 to 7. Uh, we go back to the scene view. If you remember, we've sliced our geometry up into eight pieces. And if you start counting up from 0, uh, that will get you to 7, uh, if you include 0 in the uh, incrementation. incrementation. I uh, forget I said that as a non-word. Um, OK, so we're going to click on the color, and we're going to click the attribute, and we're going to make sure it's using class. And now we're going to make sure we switch our preview to that. And we're getting a much more clear visualization of the splitting up of our terrain. So that's great. OK, um, so we're going to take a little breather there. And maybe you guys want to take a break. Uh, I'm definitely going to take a break. And we're going to jump into the next portion of our uh, of our refining the background terrain, which is we're going to be creating that gradual fall off from the inside of the terrain to the outside. So I'm going to do a slightly better drawing to illustrate what that looks like. Dense, 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 oh, he says. I'm going to have dense, 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 less, dense, less, 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 less dense. There you go. So that's what we're going to try and do with the density of the triangles. Um, 
Cool. Well, so I'll see you on the other side. Welcome back. We're now going to look at reducing the triangle density of the background terrain the further away it gets from the playable area. So to do that, we're going to be using the poly reduce node and we're going to be feeding the poly reduce node a mask, a gradual fall off that radiates from the center of the terrain outwards. So if we select a poly reduce node and have a quick look through the parameter settings, we can see there's a parameter called retain density by attribute. And that's what we're going to use here. Okay, so how are we going to proceed from this point? Well, we need to, on our background terrain, create a fall off mask, a value uh, between zero and one, one being no reduction, uh, zero being maximum reduction, that falls off from the center of our object. So how are we going to do that? Well, there are many ways to skin a cat. And the way that I'm going to go for is going to be hopefully simple to understand, even if there are more efficient ways of doing it using just VEX. Uh, for the uninitiated, VEX is a scripting language inside of Houdini that is multi-threaded and very efficient. Uh, so if you are a, are a programmer or want to learn a bit of programming, I would highly encourage you to check out VEX. It's the single most powerful tool inside of Houdini, possibly. All right, so if we're gonna minimize our reliance on any kind of programming or VEX, how are we gonna go about doing this? Well, we're just gonna try and use mostly the existing nodes inside of Houdini. Uh, okay, so where to begin? We've got our inner, inner tile here, and we've got our outer tile there. So we just kind of want to get the distance for each point on the outer tile from the inner tile. How are we going to do that? Okay, well, we're going to have a quick little nook, see if there's any node that has a name that sounds helpful. Distance from target. That sounds like it will do what we want. I'm going to put the distance from target node down. Uh, and I'm going to slide that in to the out background unoptimized there. And uh, we're going to have a quick look at the geometry spreadsheet to see what it gives us by default. We can see that it's creating a point attribute with the name distance. So let's go to the geometry spreadsheet. And uh, it's going to make sure that I have got that selected. Uh, okay, so some kind of thinking is going on here. I'm actually going to cancel that out uh, by tapping escape because it shouldn't have to think to do that. Okay, no problem. And what do we got here? We have got a distance attribute. That's great. Okay, but what are we getting the distance from currently? What is the default kind of location? Let's hit with the distance from target selected. Let's hit enter uh, with the viewport and see what happens. Okay, that's giving us some kind of visualization. So we're getting that fall off, blue being close, red being very, very far away. And we've got a point which has been placed right at the origin of the world, but we don't want it to be right at the origin of the world. We want it to be at the origin of our high poly landscape, wherever that may be. So we're gonna go back to what we did before with the circle, and we're just going to copy the line of code by selecting it, Control C. We're gonna go back to the distance from target, and we're gonna paste that in there. We're gonna grab that again, my Houdini, is being exceptionally sluggish today. My Houdini is being exceptionally sluggish today uh, without any good reason, I don't think. Uh, it's possibly because it's actually, no, no, I, I guess it's it's having to iterate over a, a lot of geometry. So I'll, 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 let it, I'll let that slide. Okay, so we've got the DX there. And actually, because it's being so sluggish, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go down and to the bottom right of the screen and I'm gonna turn off auto update and put it on manual. So what that's gonna let me do is it's gonna let me do a load of work without Houdini having to actually compute anything for a while. You can see now at the top of the viewport, it says update mode is manual, view may be out of date. Okay, that's gonna let me now copy this code in here, from here, post it in here and change it to dy because we want the y channel. And also here, because we want the z channel there. Okay, it's still taking a little while to think about it and I'm at a bit of a loss as to why. Um, it might be because my computer is starting to overheat. So I shall turn the fan up. <laughs> Hopefully that's not going to distort the recording at all. Okay. So what do we what do we see now? If we've got the distance from target node selected and we press enter, we can see that that widget is now right in the center of our high poly terrain, which is ideal. So if I go back and turn back on auto update, it's going to think for a second. And there we go. And if I hit enter again, we see now we've got that nice fall off ranging from the middle to the outer bound of the terrain. All right, so what's this mask attribute doing here? Let's have a little look at that and turn that on. All 
Okay, so we've got our mask attribute on. Let's have a little look in the geometry spreadsheet. And we can see in here that the mask is currently set to zero. And the distance is has got some really, really high values. Now, remember, we want to create a gradient between zero and one. Uh, I say remember, I'm not sure if I mentioned that previously, but basically we want to create a, a, a gradient from zero to one that we're gonna feed into the polyreduce retention uh, attribute there. And uh, what, do, what, what, how are we gonna get that zero to one gradient? Well, this mask does have something to do, to do with it. And we're just gonna go ahead and change that to maximum distance. And we're gonna have another little look in the geometry spreadsheet. Now you can see that our mask we can sort the uh, we can sort by mask is now in between the zero to one range there. Uh, oh, it's nearly within the zero to one range. No, that is in the zero to one range. These are very very small values. They just threw me for a second. Okay, so we go back to the scene view now, uh, and if we create a little uh, a color node, and we plug that in after the distance from target. Let's have a little look there, and let's go ramp from attribute and change that attribute to the mask we're going to see we are starting to get something really cool. Uh, we're getting a fall off from the center to the outer edge of the terrain. But I want to have a little bit of control over it. So let's go back to that distance from target node. And let's have a little look at this remap, this remap functionality, this remap ramp. Uh, we can hit this uh, maximize ramp button on the ramp there. And we're going to see we get the profile of that fall off. So I don't want the uh, the graph to become really unresponsive. I don't want Houdini to become really unresponsive as I drag this around. So I'm actually going to go down here and where before I set it to manual, I'm going to set it to on mouse up. That means I can now drag around this value without Houdini updating until I release it. And I'm going to I'm going to place that. I'm going to leave that on the end for now actually. And I'm going to go up here and I'm going to go for a different preset. We're going to try the smooth and we're going to reverse it. And now we're going to pull that over here. Okay, that's what I was after. Okay. Um, I'm actually going to place that back over there. And I'm going to add another point to this graph to help control the fall off a bit. I'm going to make sure that they are all set to B spline, a different kind of interpolation. And now we're getting a nice smooth fall off from the center to the out, which we have the ability to control the steepness of that gradient. I think something like that will do me nicely for now. And after the color node, we're going to put in a, I'm gonna plug that into the poly reduce node there. We're gonna remember what it's called, it's called mask the attribute there but remember the poly reduce is by default expecting retention and just for the sake of keeping the geometry spreadsheet quite informative i'm going to go to that distance from target node and i'm going to change that name to retention there we also no longer need to output the distance That's broken our color preview because that's set to mask and I'm going to change that back to retention. And now if we go down to our poly reduce, it takes a moment to think while it does some initial computation. And we're going to make sure that it takes that retention as a bias. And by default, I'm gonna set that weight to 20 so that we can really see how it's working. Okay, now, we can see that right now it's not actually doing any reduction, and that's simply because we haven't specified the percent that we'd like to keep. I'm going to change that to 10% of the 400,000. So the whole terrain is only going to be 40,000 once this is said and done. All right. Now, you'll notice if I go up and temporarily disable that color, we now have exactly what we were looking for. We have nice uh, retention of data and geometry and triangles towards the playable area, which falls off gradually towards the outer bounds of the <clears throat> towards the outer bounds of the background landscape. And if we wanted to be more aggressive with the uh, retention parameter, we could just put that weight up to fifty. All right, that might be slightly too far.
that's starting to feel like it's a good balance of keeping the detail towards the center and very quickly falling off to simplified geometry. Let's have a little look out towards the horizon. And I think I want to keep those background mountains slightly more than I am currently. So one last little tweak to 25. I saw no difference. So <laughs> we're going to go back down to our original. Looks like 20 might have been a good guess. All right, that's a little bit better. That's more to my taste. Okay, so let's just have a little look at before the reduce, make sure we're not losing too much detail there. I think that's doing a fairly good job of retaining. I'm going to turn off the wire shading. I think that's doing a fairly good job of retaining those background mountains as much as we need them. Of course, this is all down to personal preference and the kind of project you're working on. And since this is for a tutorial, not for a live game, I'm going to go ahead and keep a little bit more of that input geometry just to make it look as good as possible. Okay, cool. So we've now reduced our 430,000. Oopsie, I've just disabled it, so it's going to have to recook. Four hundred thirty thousand down to one hundred thousand. Great. Now, if we plug that into our four inch begin and let that run again, we're going to get our end result, which is some very nice uh, reduced slices. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go before that color, and we're just going to have a look at our end result there. We've got each of our uh, little slices. We've got a nice fall off in geometry density as well. Uh, if we just flip back to our starting point, I think it's clear to see that we've made a big improvement already. Okay, great. So we've reduced our geometry, and we now want to think about how do we get this exported from Houdini and send it into Unreal. Now, if we just put down a rock FBX output, it's still going to export each of these slices as a, a, as one kind of joined piece of geometry. So we're going to have to use another for loop. Uh, it's not going to be a for loop with feedback. It's going to be a for named primitive, for each named primitive. So with the first one, we just used for each primitive because we were just using the primitive numbers. And now we want to take advantage of the name, uh, or in our case, the attribute that we're called class, which was generated by our connectivity node here. And now if we plug the output there into the for each loop, we're going to see that it doesn't work. <laughs> All right. And that's because it's looking for the class attribute for the primitives. And actually, uh, if we have a quick look at the geometry spreadsheet, our class attribute is stored in our points. So we just need to go to the end for each loop block, and we need to set that to points. And we go back to have a little look. And if it doesn't work straight away, you might need to hit reset cache pass. Very interesting. For each point, points, class, uh, reset cache pass. I always like it when something goes wrong on a on a on an actual tutorial. Class, class, points, points. Alrighty, we got a little problem here. What's that about? So it's getting all the points, but it's only getting the points. Now, I don't think that's how this usually works, but maybe I've just forgotten something. Um, but to try and get around it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the piece elements to primitives again, and we're going to do a little attribute promote, or ATP if you can't spell like me. I'm going to place that after the color, and we're going to make sure that it's promoting from point to primitive, and it's going to promote piece attribute class. And we're going to hit reset cache pass. I'm going to have a look at the input that that's receiving. Wrong there. Invalid attribute specification. Class. Class. <laughs> Class. Name.
Well, um, I'm just going to go up to the connectivity type and I'm going to change that to primitive so that we create our class as a primitive, our class attribute as a primitive straight away. All right. And then we're going to make sure that our color node is set to primitive here as well. So it's finding the class attribute on the primitives. And we no longer need the attribute promote. And now let's see what it does. Hit reset cache pass. And finally, we're getting what we wanted. So I'm at a little bit of a loss as to what I was doing wrong there. Uh, maybe someone who used Houdini a bit more than me uh, can help explain it to me. Never mind. All right. So now if we go and have a look at the end, it's going to be giving us all of those pieces. And if we turn on single pass, we can slide through those. I'm just going to go make sure I'm back on auto update because I no longer want to be on mouse up. So as I slide this value, it's going to switch between all of those slices. Great. So we want to export these one at a time. And you might think that we could just go in, plug in our ROP FBX there uh, and run the for each loop and it would, it would work. But unfortunately, uh, that's not going to do the trick for two reasons. The first reason is that the ROP FBX button relies on having this save to disk button pressed. So there's that's not something which gets run automatically when it's just you know passed through a network like this, unlike a file cache, which does run automatically or can be set to run automatically. So that's one of the issues. Um, actually, <laughs> that's pretty much the only issue. And uh, what we're going to do here is we're going to write a little bit of Python. Uh, now, don't, don't be afraid if you've never used Python before, because this literally is just one line of Python, and it makes your life a whole lot easier. So what we're going to do is we're going to type in Python here, find a Python node. We're going to stick that into our node graph. And uh, by default, we're actually just going to disable it while we're, while we're editing it, because we don't want to accidentally export stuff uh, while we are working. Um, and we just need to write in a simple line of code, which is going to press that button for us. So uh, yeah, you can code Python, you can use Python to basically do user inputs to, to sort of mimic uh, a, a user working in Houdini to press any button, change any variable, anything you want. So Python in Houdini is super powerful. Um, I'm only just getting to grips with it myself and I'm waiting for I'm the highly anticipated uh, Python states uh, tutorial series uh, or course that uh, Paul Ambrosian has been working on recently. So for those of you that don't know, Paul Ambrosian uh, is a, uh, he used to be the lead of the, the Side Effects Labs team, uh, and he's recently kind of gone off on his own to, uh, to, to do really cool stuff. And a Python stakes course is one of them. Um, but we're not going to be doing anything that advanced. Uh, we're just going to be using one line uh, of code here. And that line of code, you can just steal. It's who.palm. And then we're going to find with the uh, inverted commas like that. Uh, similarly to the object, no, similarly to when we were referencing variables before, we're going to find the node we want to use. In this case, it is the ROP FBX2. And uh, we want to push the button uh, save to disk. But what's that save to disk button actually called? If we mouse over it, you can see it's called execute. Uh, so save to disk is just a user friendly label. So we want to push the execute button. There you go. You can see it auto completes for us there. Uh, nice and helpful. And we're going to close that inverted comma and close those braces. And we're going to do dot press button like so. OK, so that's going to do the button pressing for us. And if we go out here, uh, we can see that the output file is currently set to current directory. That's dollar hip. Uh, and it's going to be called dot out. It's going to be called out and it's going to be an FBX file. If we click this little icon to the far right there, uh, open floating file chooser, uh, I'm going to click right click and expand path, find the path, and then I'm going to open Windows Explorer. There we go. We're going to go to the output folder. And we can see that currently it would just be spat out in the top level, which I don't want to do. I want to put it in another folder. So we're going to call this folder slices, like so. And now I'm just going to run that Python script by un. un disabling it, unbypassing it. OK, let's go in here and let's see if it has export anything. Uh, OK, it didn't export anything. So what are we missing? Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and hit reset cache pass. I'm going to go back to Windows Explorer and see if it's done anything directly there. So what are we missing? We're missing something crucial here. And uh, OK, I just forgot something quite simple. The end of this press button here, we just need to open and close those braces. And now you'll see where we hit reset cache pass. We go back to disk, and look for slices it's created that output. So let's just see what it's output for us, shall we? Copy that path. Put that in here. 
All right, so we can see it's quite simply just put out uh, one of those single uh, slices. Uh, and that's because at the end of the for each loop here, well, one of the reasons is because at the end of the for each loop here, we've currently got it set to single pass. So what's going to happen if we turn off single pass and run that for each loop by setting the focus to it? OK, well, we still only get one output file. But inside of the 3D viewport, we're getting all of those slices. So what went wrong? Let's go and have a little look at the file over here, too. Uh, if we go reload geometry. OK, we're just getting one slice. So why are we only getting one slice? It's because we're outputting all of the files with the same name. So we need to somehow, inside the file name, account for the fact that we're actually getting different pieces. Now, there's a few ways to do this. Uh, so the way that I'm going to show you is we're going to copy this input here. Uh, we're going to slice that wire. And we're going to change this for each begin node here from method fetch piece or point to fetch metadata. And you're going to see now in the metadata, we have some detail attributes. So with this node selected, if we go to the geometry spreadsheet and go to that last little button, you're going to see we have got some detail attributes which correspond to A, which iteration is the for loop currently on, the overall number of iterations and value, I think, is just the same as iteration in this case. OK, so we want to somehow plumb that iteration value into this rock FBX. So let's do that. We're going to go to the rock FBX. And you might be able to guess how we do this before. Uh, do this again. So if we just go back up to that distance from target node, we'll see that the clue is in here somewhere. Yes, you may have guessed it correctly. So congrats if you did. We want to get access to, we want to get a reference to this file, and we want to get that attribute from it. So it's slightly different this time. Because we're looking for a detail attribute, what we need to do is we need to a, put in a little back tip to say that we're about to write some script in what would otherwise just be a path name. There you go. So we're working inside these back ticks. Now, pay attention because we're not using uh, quotation marks. We're not using inverted commas. We're using back ticks. Uh, I don't know where that is on a non-English keyboard, but on an English keyboard, uh, it's above tab and left of one. OK, and we're going to type in detail because we're looking for a detail attribute. We're going to go open braces, and it's going to give us some information about what we need to find. And we need to get a reference to the node. So we're going to go quotation marks dot dot forward slash for each begin for. OK, comma, attribute name. Well, we're looking for iteration. So I'm going to type in iteration. And then this very last attrib index, we can just put in zero because it only has one index. That index is only really relevant if you're doing a vector. If you're using a vector and you want to get either the x, y, or z channel of the vector. All right. So we've input that little bit of code there. Uh, and what happens if we run the for each loop again? You can see we're getting out. So that first out can go away because it's, it's no longer necessary. You can see that we've got out 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. So we're getting all of our files. And indeed, if we go to this file node and change show sequences one entry and have a little look, we can just change out to out one. And you're going to see it's going to go through each of those slices. So we're very nearly there now. Uh, we're pretty much finished. And we're just going to do a little bit of housekeeping at the end here. We're going to make it so that we actually set the name to be slices uh, underscore. There we go. It's going to be slightly more readable. I'm going to delete those. I'm going to run that little script again there. And if you select that by, if you focus it like that and it doesn't actually run, what you can do is you can just hit reset cache pass. And there you go. It's going to output all of those slices onto disk for you. Um, oh, I say that's the end. We should probably actually take this stuff into Unreal. So I'm going to go back. Uh, we've got our low res terrain there. I'm going to go to Windows Explorer. And uh, uh, if anyone can tell me what I've forgotten now, um, then a point to you. Um, I have forgotten that I need to, oh, where's the project? There we go. Scale it up by a factor of 100. So we're just going to do that. And then we're going to run that for each loop. And we're going to get those files re-exported onto disk very quickly. I'm going to go to Unreal. I'm going to grab all the slices. I'm going to go pretty much ignore the import settings for now. Go Import All. We're just going to make a little, uh, we're going to copy the location from this one in case we need it. And we're going to go ahead and delete the old background terrain. We'll pull in the new one. First of all, we're going to try setting it to zero, which I suspect isn't going to be the right place. No, it's not. So it's going to go ahead and paste. Oh, maybe it was the right place. We're going to go back to that. I'm going to make sure that the rotation is set to minus 90. And then we're going to paste that location in there. All right. So 
we've got our new uh, and improved background terrain. We're not done with it yet. We still need to make it blend into the uh, blend it into the high high high, high poly terrain in the middle. Uh, the whole the whole terrain needs a kind of beautifying pass to go over it. Uh, but we've actually got kind of all of the elements we need to keep going forwards now. Uh, and if we go down low, uh, it's probably <laughs> probably I've kept more geometry than was absolutely necessary. Uh, I could have been more ruthless with my optimization. Okay. So once we've got everything exported, imported into Unreal, we're going to just do one more thing. So that's we're, we're going to check that this pizza slicing method has actually done what we set out to do, uh, and that is uh, occluding the triangles that are behind us. So we can just very quickly and brute force test this by facing one direction in the in the landscape, and uh, let's use the command uh, freeze rendering. So you can access that by pressing the back tick. So now you see you get this little notification saying rendering is frozen. And if we just fly up, you're going to see, OK, well, it's doing partially what we expected, but there's probably a bit more geometry than we really hoped to be rendering uh, rendering at all times. And let's, let's just have another little look up over here and try it again. You can see the same thing again. We're only really culling about half of the overall uh, half of the overall triangles. So let's have a quick look over here and uh, see the same thing again. Uh, it's not really ideal. It's not quite what we're expecting. So how can we improve that? Well. We're just going to do a little bit more uh, in, uh, sort of digging around. Uh, I'm going to press G to turn off game mode, and I'm going to go up and uh, turn off that fog again because it's in the way. I'm going to type in show flag dot bounds one, and now you can see the reason why our occlusion culling isn't really working the way we hoped it would. It's because oh, there we go. If we go back to get game mode and press G, you can see that the bounds doesn't actually tightly fit over our triangle because it's rectangular. Uh, and uh, it's it's going to be visible on much more of the screen than just the small portion that is actually visible. So even when we're looking over here, for example, it's still going to be loading that geometry over there. So how do we deal with that? Well, we can go in and edit the bounds, and we can abuse the fact that we're only going to be seeing the mesh from viewed within inside of the playable area. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's open up the mesh here, and I'm just going to press I'm going to go and increase my speed multiplier up here so we can fly around and actually, well, that's not even nearly fast enough. Let's try that. There we go. So we're going to move the bounds so that they're only at this end of the terrain slice, which is the slice connecting to our playable area. I'm going to type in bounds here and take advantage of the fact that I kind of have an idea of what kind of values we need to be dealing with already. So I'm going to type in minus 35 million. I don't know, 350,000 maybe. And that didn't work. It went the wrong way. So I'm going to do it on this side instead. Uh, that went too far. So I'm going to set that to 23 instead. And you can see now that that's just nicely containing this end of the uh, landscape segment. And then I'm also going to do this one here. OK, that's the wrong end. So I'll do it over here instead. Nope. My mistake. There we go. So now we just got a very small little kind of uh, chunk. Uh, which is no longer stretching off a ridiculously long distance. Uh, I, I probably want it to be a little bit longer than that, just in case uh, I happen to catch the landscape at a glancing angle either here or there. Uh, in fact, that's that's fine. We know that the that triangle is going to be visible when it's there, so we we can live we can live with that. Okay, cool. Uh, so now let's jump back inside of uh, of Unreal, uh, and I'm just going to quickly. I've already done it, so I'm just going to flick off the old bounds and turn on the new bounds. And uh, if we go G here, you can see that we have actually got uh, all of those now. They're just containing a much smaller area. Um, I've, I've actually done one other thing too, which is I've applied a bounds scale multiplier because just setting it to the default of one uh, there uh, meant that when you came sort of up to the kind of edge of the landscape uh, here, you do get those moments where you actually lose the terrain, even though you can see it. Um, that's not such a problem in the center of the terrain. and to be honest, uh, in most game scenarios, you're not going to want the player to be going right up to the edge of the playable terrain anyway, because you, they will notice the uh, the kind of fall off in quality uh, the closer they get to this fake mesh that we have as our backdrop. So it's usual that you would actually have a high poly mesh. Uh, the high poly terrain is larger than the playable area that you defined. So if you're quite certain that the player is never going to leave this playable area, the method for setting the bounds that I just showed you should do the trick. But if you find that you are getting moments of clipping like that, where the where the where the mesh where the background slice is being tagged as not visible, uh, what you can do is you can just grab those slices and you can play a slight bound scale multiplier. Let's try one point two, 
and you should see that even with relatively small small increments, small small scale increases, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, let's try. There we go. Now you can see that we're not getting those issues anymore, uh, except when we go right to the very extreme ends, which isn't an area you want your player to be going in. Anyway, so there you go. Uh, and that's just to, to verify that that's doing the trick. Uh, let's try that freeze rendering command again. And now you can see that more of the terrain is being flagged as not rendering uh, when you are looking out from the center. There we go. So it's not a huge difference, but uh, it's enough to make the difference between being three of these tiles and maybe four or five. Uh, so let's just do one last thing. Let's go stat RHI. Uh, yep, and have a quick look at the triangles drawn. Let's make sure that the uh, turn off freeze, uh, let's make sure that the landscape is hidden. Uh, and you can see now we're rendering only 70,000 tries down from the 400,000. And I was not as aggressive as I could have been uh, with that reduction. All right, so let's turn off freeze rendering and uh, let's just have a little look around. And you can see that we're getting between 25 and 100,000. 110,000, depending on where in the scene that we're looking. Oh, there's a point there where you can get 200. Oh, and one thing to mention is that the absolute worst case scenario is when you're at far end of the landscape looking out across it, you're going to be seeing uh, many of those tiles. And that's it. Um, there are quite a bit of discussion around what's the best way to actually slice up these background terrain pieces. Um, so uh, there are some people that suggest that you might be better served by, oh, that you might be better served by instead of slicing it up into this kind of pizza slice method, uh, what you could do instead is have kind of boxes uh, that come away from the terrain. So maybe you would slice it up like something something along these lines. Uh, ooh, second. And the advantage of doing it this way is that your bounds will be able to fit over those uh, slices much more cleanly because they're rectangular. Uh, and that will mean that the occlusion culling will be a, a lot more accurate off the bat without having to do any of those extra modifications. Uh, and you also have the added advantage that these background pieces will be occluded by the foreground pieces in some scenarios, which means you won't draw them there. So if you want to go take this a little bit further, then uh, your homework for this week uh, or your challenge is to go away and think about how you would slice up your background terrain using this kind of method instead. Uh, and that's it for today's session. Um, thanks a ton for sticking around. I know it was a long one again. Um, that just seems to be the way with these things. There's quite a lot to cover. But I hope that you learned a lot of useful tricks relating to Houdini. Um, and uh, I'd really love to hear your thoughts on the tutorial series, what you'd like to see next. Uh, we will be covering grass. We will be going back to the landscape uh, layered material setup. And we will be improving the textures in short order. Uh, thanks a ton. And uh, I'll uh, catch you next time.